I'm Professor Martin Bricknell, Professor of Conflict, Health and Military Medicine at King's College London. And this video is one of a series on security and military health. And the video will cover security sector health services. What I hope uh, we will achieve through you watching this video is an increased understanding of the components of a security sector, the understanding of the potential components of a security sector health system, and then some frameworks to analyze the purpose and beneficiaries of an individual security sector health system. And finally, to understand some key sources of information on security sector health systems. Uh, and the purpose of this learning is to illustrate that understanding security sector health systems is important to the understanding of military health systems. We'll use two definitions shown on the slide the first is security sector, covering all actors and institutions concerned with national and human security. A little bit more on that in the video. And finally, the term beneficiaries to cover the members of populations entitled to access health services. Prior to watching this video, I recommend that you watch the video titled Security and Military Health, Health Systems and Services, uh, with the link shown on the slide. Uh, and this video provides a contextual overview of a whole country's health service. And it's supported by the academic paper, Understanding the Structure of a Country's Health Services Providers for Defence Health Engagement, uh, published in BMJ Military Health. So the video will cover what is a security sector, uh, what security services might have health services, who might be the beneficiaries of a security sector health service and how might a security sector health service be organized. And the video is based on two papers I've published. The first is security health sector uh, systems and global health from BMJ military health. And the second is understanding the whole of military health systems published in the RUSI journal. So, let us consider health provision in Saudi Arabia. In addition to the Ministry of Health, there are three other government funded health services which provide finance to deliver primary, secondary and tertiary care to specific enrolled security and armed forces populations. They are the Ministry of Defence and Aviation, the Ministry of Interior and the Saudi Arabian National Guard. You then do a search on Google Maps for hospitals in Riyadh, the capital, you'll find the following uh, security force hospitals. The first, the Prince Sultan Military Medical City, which is the largest military hospital complex and referral centre for the treatment of armed forces personnel and their dependents. And currently there are over uh, 1,190 beds and the clinical services include accident and emergency maternity care, intensive care, theatre, renal dialysis, uh, renal and liver transplantation, and cardiac investigations and surgery. Uh, the second is the National Guard Hospital, uh, based in the King Abdulaziz Medical City, of nearly 1800 beds, providing all types of care to members of the National Guard, their dependents, civilians, and VIP patients. And it comprises the King Fayed National Guard Hospital, the King Abdulaziz Cardiac Center, the King Abdulaziz Dental Center, a surgical and trauma suite, and hepatobiliary services and organ transplant services. And it's supported by a polyclinic elsewhere in the city. The final uh, security force hospital is that term security forces hospital, which is a 400 bed hospital serving the needs of employees of the Ministry of Interior and their dependents. And the final one on the slide is the King Salomon Hospital, which came up on Google, but in fact is a public um, hospital run by the Ministry of Health. So this example shows that in many countries, the security services operate a health service that is government funded and runs alongside Ministry of Health public health systems. So what is a security sector? Well, the term originates from the challenges in securing peace in peacekeeping. And it reflects the need to engage with armed actors on both sides of a conflict 
in order to encourage them to achieve a peace settlement and then to reduce the size of the security institutions through disarmament, demobilization and reintegration. And this led to the concept of security sector reform that emerged in the late 1990s, early 2000s. The definition of security sector reform is shown on the slide and is taken from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It includes all the actors, their roles and responsibilities and actions in the provision of national security and also security of individuals, namely human security. And the idea of security sector reform is to shift the management and governance of the security sector to be consistent with democratic norms and contribute to a well-functioning security network within a country. Now, the security sector may well have, as we've described, their own health systems. This um, is part of what we might call the moral component of fighting power. You are prepared to put yourself at risk if you know that you have a high quality medical system that could look after you if you became sick or injured. But furthermore, health services are a significant non-financial benefit of government service. And so the size of the security health services within a government health system might be quite significant and might have considerable influence on the national health system itself. So let us consider who might be security sectors and forces. Uh, and this slide uh, again is derived from the OECD definition of the security sector and starts from the top. If you consider a country as a, um, a border of land defined by international law and inside it is a nation and it's governed on behalf of the state by the government and the president or head of state might have their own presidential guard which is a security institution below the government level there might be individual ministries that have responsibility for different components of national security covering intelligence uh, defense uh, traditionally including the navy army and air force with a focus on external security uh, the justice sector might run prisons uh, the interior department might run national or federal police and an armed gendarmerie. Uh, the border department might control border police and the transport uh, ministry might control transport police. And below national government, at regional government or local government, they might all have control of some aspect of police forces. And then beyond the government, there might be non-state providers of security either commercial security companies operating within the country or international partners, particularly during periods of insecurity. That might mean international military forces or international private security companies. Each of these individual security services might have their own health system. So let us now consider these in turn. Uh, perhaps the best uh, example, of course, is the healthcare services of armed forces. Uh, and these tend to have three roles. The first is a field medical service to care for wounded and sick personnel on military operations, primarily overseas. Then an occupational health service to maximize the medical fitness of armed forces personnel. And finally, a curative health service, namely garrison healthcare and hospital care to care for entitled beneficiaries which might be more than just uniformed armed forces personnel. And I've shown a reference to a paper where we've analyzed the uh, record of individual military medical services across the world to look at key uh, comparative factors between uh, armed forces medical services. Now this will be a subject of a further uh, video in this series. It's clear from the diagram I showed about uh, security services that within a country there may be several types of police and uh, police services might actually outnumber the uniformed armed forces. 
uh, police services might need a field medical service in support of internal security operations and therefore might train medical personnel to provide um, first aid and additional care for people injured on internal security operations. Uh, police will almost certainly need an occupational health service to maximise the medical fitness of their personnel. Uh, and then finally, depending on the arrangements, there might be a curative health service that is specifically there to care for police personnel and their dependents. Uh, the other population that is the responsibility of the security institutions is prisoners. And there is a legal responsibility to meet the health needs of prisoners who are uh, under detention and therefore not subject to freedoms to choose. In armed conflict, uh, these are defined as prisoners of war and detainees for which there is specific provision under the Geneva Conventions and the duty of um, the armed forces to ensure the provision of healthcare to um, these populations. In a stable peace situation, the prisons are normally part of the justice sector, but there is some international debate over the most suitable governance arrangements for uh, provision of health services for prisoners within prisons. And the slide shows um, a document from the uh, Regional Office for Europe of the WHO that uh, sets some standards for prisons and health systems within prisons. And there is debate as to whether actually this should be the responsibility of the Ministry of Public Health rather than the Ministries of Justice. One final group to consider is the commercial provision of medical support to security services, um, both as part of routine care and possibly also part of deployed operations. Um, there's an increased market in this field. Um, there are international companies that provide um, commercial health services um, across the world, and therefore they are uh, potentially accessible to uh, deployed military medical services or security forces and there are ways of pooling funding uh, to provide the finance to enable commercial providers to meet this requirement and, and in some circumstances this offsets a shortage in security or military healthcare workers. The slide shows two examples. The first is a research paper that looks at the provision of battlefield care during the campaign to free Mosul in Iraq from ISIS control and the use of um, commercial companies to um, provide additional battlefield care. And the second slide shows the provision of a hospital in, uh, in Kosovo by a commercial company in support of NATO operations. So as I've suggested, it is possible that the security health system might be a significant uh, proportion of a nation's health economy uh, and indeed might have some very significant uh, hospitals and institutions. The slide shows the hospital of the National Defense Medical Center of the uh, Republic of China, Taiwan. And if you just think of the size of some armed forces, that represents a considerable population at risk in garrison. So with China having over 2 million active duty armed forces personnel, India 1.5 million, USA nearly 1.5 million, North Korea and Russia, all of these countries are likely to have very significant sized um, military health services. And if you add in the beneficiary populations beyond purely uniform active duty personnel, this can uh, result in quite significant numbers of people. From the USA perspective, this is uh, tens of millions of um, personnel who are the responsibility of either of the Depart Department of Defense or the Veterans Administration. In Jordan, the Royal Medical Service, which is a uniform medical service, has responsibility for about a third of, the, of Jordan's uh, registered population. And as another example in Peru, uh, the armed forces and national police and private sector uh, contribute to providing services for about 10 percent 
of the Peruvian population. Um, we touched on beneficiaries and, and this term is very helpful to think of the population at risk, um, both in terms of volume and also types of health needs when you come to look at a security sector health service. So uh, this slide shows firstly the uniformed component, which might be active duty, in other words, full time. They might be reservists um, available on a part time basis or the National Guard who are there to provide uh, internal um, mobilized military manpower. Then there's their families, which might just be spouse and children, but in some countries that includes parents and grandparents. Um, beneficiaries might include civilians, so employees of the Ministry of Defense or Ministry of Interior, uh, designated specific entitlements such as uh, VIPs, there might be arrangements whereby uh, people can access security health services as private patients, either through direct payments to the institution or payments to the health service providers. And then finally, there might be a mechanism for free access for civilians. And I've already touched on the importance of considering prisoners and detainees as uh, beneficiary populations that need to be considered. In terms then of clinical services, one way of um, uh, describing the arrangements for clinical services is to take the patient perspective. So the patient uh, in the security services will come from the citizen's pool uh, and will have to meet med certain medical standards. And then they will be cared for inside military or security garrisons. And so um, that covers garrisons and community services, primary health care, um, community mental health services, dental care, and uh, rehabilitation services as examples. Where the security services conduct operations that put personnel at risk, then there might be the need for a specific field medical service shown in the picture as an operational patient care pathway. Uh, injured personnel from operations might need access to definitive health care, which I've turned in the slide firm base, which includes hospitals, but might include other specialist inpatient services, such as rehabilitation and occupational referral services. Uh, for militaries, this can include underwater medicine and aviation medicine. At some point, active duty personnel will uh, retire from service, either um, as veterans, in other words, people who have got a medical condition attributable to their military service or as pure retirees. And again, depending on entitlements, they might still be able to have access to healthcare. And when one considers this wider beneficiary entitlement, very often uh, the families are, of security force personnel are entitled and because they tend to be quite young, then there's likely to be a very significant demand for maternity care in support of um, families of security personnel. Now, we haven't completely deconstructed this uh, diagram in this video, and a, another video will discuss this in considerable additional detail. So that's a brief overview. Um, further sources of information on security health systems are available from these uh, slides. Um, military health services can be um, analysed according to uh, each nation, and there is a database, the Almanac Military Medical Corps Worldwide, that contains a description of each nation's military medical system. I've been unable to find anything that provides a global overview of police health services. Um, but from a prison health services perspective, the Worldwide Prison Health Research and Engagement Network provides a forum for policy and uh, collaboration around the uh, provision of health services to prisoners within prisons. So how might you consider interpreting what I've talked about? Well, one aspect is to consider the proportional contribution of security health systems to national health economies and how that might be measured. 
both in cost, numbers of facilities, um, personnel, either personnel employed or personnel who are beneficiaries and health outputs. And this is uh, important when considering comparisons both um, between um, security health systems between countries and also the relative contribution of a security health system within a country compared to, for instance, the Ministry of Public Health. And a deeper philosophical question, particularly uh, from the perspective of security sector reform, is this one of, is provision of inequitable access or quality of healthcare by government to the security sector workforce anti-democratic? Because it certainly would go against the, the principles of equity and equality of access for government, for citizens of a nation. I've also provided some links to further information, uh, some academic papers, and a video that provides a very good description of the um, emergency medicine system um, in the field from one nation's uh, military health system. So concluding the video, what I hope is that I have uh, given you additional understanding of the components of a security sector. Uh, I've given you some understanding of the potential components of a security sector health system. We have analyzed the purpose and beneficiaries of a security health system in order to understand key sources of information on security health systems. And this provides a context for a deeper analysis of military health systems. And I've touched on definitions of security sector and definitions of beneficiaries. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I hope you found this video and other videos helpful in your studies.